Greetings. Um, my name is Peggy Datermeyer. I'm the Bioethics and Aging Fellow here at the Hope and Healing Center. Uh, for those who have not been here before, the Hope and Healing Center is primarily a mental health outreach. We offer more than 40 different support groups. We have classes. We have training for pastors and community members. We have um, mental health coaching, and we do research. And aging is under the heading of mental health, obviously, because as we get older, we have to consider some of the issues. So this is the third in a series of five different programs on aging well that we've done this year. We did a program in December uh, with Amazing Place, which was spectacular. Uh, Dr. Julie Kutak from the Alzheimer's Association spoke on Tuesday of this week. Today's program was supposed to be in January, but we got frozen out. And um, then in March, as you saw, if you were paying attention to the slides flipping through, Dr. Tim Van Dyvendijk will be coming to talk about the unwanted gift of grief. So if you know of anybody who's grieving, has some grief issues, job losses, it's not just people dying. And that was my question. It's not limited to seniors. So it's no, ma'am. Aging well is not just, is not intended. She asked whether it was for seniors. It's not just for seniors. Our program's on aging well. Everybody's aging, right? Even if you're 23, you're aging. So um, he's speaking in, in March, and he's fantastic. He's the retired senior executive for chaplaincy at the Memorial Hermann Health System. And then um, Rebecca Lundstrom, who is an attorney, is going to talk about different aspects of advanced care planning in April. And that's April is the month where National Healthcare Decision Day occurs, which is meant to bring some community awareness to the importance of preparing your advanced directives. And um, so we're really excited about this pro the programs we have this year. And I also want to remind everyone um, that we took up the time today that we normally allocate to Cafe Change, Conversations on Health and Navigating Good Elderhood. And that's just a very informal forum for people to come and talk about issues. Uh, we have different topics that we, some months we have a specific topic we're talking about, and some months we just sit and talk. And for the next couple of months, uh, I've been, I'm the facilitator for that group, and it's been suggested that we do something on nutrition as you're aging. And uh, one of our members is going to do a program and give some advice on online dating for those of you <laughs> who are in that, and how to stay safe in online dating. So we do, we do lots of cool stuff over here. Keep an eye on our website. Um, we're in the process of developing programs for next year. So if you come up with any ideas that you would like to learn more about, um, I have cards with me. See me after the program and give me a call or shoot me an email. So today's talk is on Medicare and Medicaid and what do I need to know. As most of us who are over 65 know, uh, Medicare kicks in, in most cases, when you're 65. I'm going to talk a little bit about the exceptions to that. Um, but the important, this, these two programs were implemented during the Johnson administration in 1965. So they've been around for a really long time. And as you can imagine, the rules and regulations associated with these two programs are huge. What I have tried to do is hit the high spots so that everybody at least has some foundation of knowledge. And then at the end of the presentation, I have a list of resources that would at least get you started if you have more questions. Some questions I can answer, but I don't pretend to be the world's greatest living expert on Medicare and Medicaid. I've just learned a lot from dealing with aging parents, dealing with 
um, people who come to talk to me, and I just am trying to get the word out to have people pay attention to this. Um, I may set, make some comments that sound a little bit political. I'm not trying to espouse any particular political position. I know everyone sitting in this auditorium has a different view of how things should be. But what I do believe is that everybody needs to understand what is happening. Because all of us, God willing, will turn will be in a situation to deal with one or the other or both of these programs. And there's an awful lot of misunderstanding about what things are covered and what things aren't covered. And some people end up being surprised. So um, I'm, I would normally prefer to have people stop and ask questions as we're going along because we're recording this. I've been asked to try to keep most of the questions to the end, but if you have really something that you're confused about, raise your hand and I'll try to remember to repeat the question so that everybody hears it and it gets on tape. So what I, oops, come back. So what I'll start with today is describing some of the basic fundamental differences. And again, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I have had friends who are very smart, knowledgeable people make comments to me that just make my hair stand on end um, because of the assumptions that are made about what these programs cover and what they don't cover. Um, the funding sources are different and that's where some of the politics comes in because of the way states have chosen to offer these programs, and I'll talk a little bit about that and put it in the context of Texas. Um, we have different qualifications for the programs, requirements that have to be met, and finally, I wanna give you, like I said, I'm gonna give you a list of resources if you can't get them all copied down, don't worry about it. Again, if you, sh if you call me or s give me uh, an email address, I'll send you the whole presentation, and then you, you'll have all the links that, are, that I've used, and you'll be able to get to those yourself. So, the fundamental definitions. Medicare is a healthcare insurance program primarily for those over 65. So, the exceptions are folks with certain kinds of disabilities. So if someone has become completely disabled and they've worked enough quarters and they collect social security uh, early because they're disabled, then some people can become eligible for Medicare. Again, not everybody, but some people. Medicaid, on the other hand, is an assistance program that covers people of any age. So I have had, I've, I had somebody who's near and dear to my heart make an offhanded statement one day about, well, that's just a program for those women, poor women who keep having babies. And I bit my tongue and I said very calmly, no, it's not. When it comes to the numbers of people receiving benefits, half of them are children. When it comes to the dollars that are spent on Medicaid programs, 75% goes to adults and seniors, and that's, as you can imagine, because of the aging population, it's trending more to seniors. And there's specific things that are covered, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go along. The question is, these are for the national populations. Yes, that is correct. I didn't try to do a state-by-state -state analysis. This is strictly for the US. And if you go online to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, there's more data than you can shake a stick at um, that you can go into. But I think it's important for people to understand that, right? Because when we start hearing things, 
And there's an awful lot of, there's been a lot of conversations starting with the proposed changes to the Affordable Care Act last year. And now with the, the budget proposals that are being made, there are even more changes being proposed. So all I'm saying is start to listen and pay attention to that because we as voters need to understand what's going on and we need to know where we stand so that we can inform our representatives on what we want them to do. And that's the important thing, right? At the end of the day, those folks are supposed to work for us. So, Medicare is completely federally funded. Medicaid, on the under, other hand, has dual funding. An amount comes from the federal government. Everything else comes from the state. So that means every state has their own rules and their own funding mechanisms. If you look at the state of Oregon as an example, they have made a decision as a state that they want everyone to have health insurance. And so they have geared their Medicaid program to cover everybody. And trust me, it's been a challenge for them because they've also made the decision that all of this is going to happen within the structure of their state budget and they will not go into a loss. So they've tweaked, the, they're constantly tweaking the program year over year. And they, some years, you know, they got to the point where they had 94, 95% of their population covered. It got too expensive, so they geared it back with having more co-pays and more um, contributions and then the percentage would go down and then they would make some more adjustments and they, it's just been a roller coaster for them. Texas, on the other hand, has essentially made a choice not to expand the program under the, under the Affordable Care Act. Under the Affordable Care Act, states could make a contribution, an additional contribution, and then the feds would give a bigger amount. And the state of Texas made a choice not to do that. So when you, talk, when you see the eligibilities for Texas, they're a lot tighter than they are in some other states. Okay? So, Medicare is covered. You are eligible if you have contributed to the system for 40 quarters the equivalent of 10 years. It doesn't have to have been consecutive 10 years, but you have to have contributed to the system for 40 quarters, okay? Medicaid, on the other hand, is means tested. So it's tied to your income and your assets. And it's, as I've already mentioned, it's different for each state. So um, I have a friend who emigrated here legally from Canada, and she was a nurse, and her husband was semi-retired, and so she went back to, the wor to work as a nurse for 10 full years so that she, she and her husband could be eligible for Medicare. And that's perfectly legal, that's fine. On the other hand, if someone has been self-employed or worked for a company um, that didn't contribute to Medicare, to the system, then they may not be eligible. And that does happen. Um, I had a friend some years ago whose husband died rather suddenly when he was young, and he had worked different kinds of jobs, and he had worked for some places where he didn't contribute to Medicare. And Joni's scowling. <laughs> It, uh, it, it, was, it had to do with the kinds of jobs he had had, working for really small companies or working for himself. And so um, when he died suddenly, his wife got nothing on, her, on his account. So Medicare has four different parts. Part A is hospitalization. It doesn't have a premium, but it does have a deductible. And I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Part B, which is for essentially 
doctor's visits and tests and that sort of thing, outpatient services, uh, physical therapy, anything you can name, you have to pay a sliding scale premium to be eligible. So some folks who turn 65, they'll get Part A because they've, you know, when you sign up for Social Security, it's pretty much automatic. Or if you have turned 65 and you're not collecting Social Security yet, you can sign up for Medicare. Um, so for folks who have been semi-retired or haven't worked for someone who has health insurance, it becomes a good qualifier. But the thing to keep in mind is A is hospitalization, B is major medical. Part C covers what we sometimes call a Medicare replacement or a Medicare HMO. And those come up for eligibility usually every December. And that's when you start seeing the TV ads from Humana and Aetna and Cigna and United Healthcare. And what they want you to do is to sign up for their Medicare replacement. And we'll talk about that a little more in a minute and some of the issues that come up with that. And then finally, Part D is the Medicare um, medications, so premiums. Um, but the premiums depend on the plan that you're on. So there is a premium, um, and it depends on which plan you're on. So Medicare Part A covers an acute care hospital, and that's med speak for you go to one of the major hospitals in the medical center, you go to one of the community hospitals, as long as they are legal with Medicare, you can go there and Medicare will cover you within the structures of what they cover. Um, which the thing, if you want to know whether the hospital is covered, you can look on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website and they'll tell you. And they also have ratings for hospitals. A, Medicare Part A also covers a long-term acute care hospital, or it's an LTAC for short. So if any of you have had a very serious illness that was extending beyond a normal stay in, a, in an acute care hospital, you will sometimes be referred to an LTAC. Uh, one of an, an example I would come up with is anyone who uh, has a tracheostomy and a feeding tube will typically be sent to an LTAC out of an acute care hospital um, because the acute care hospitals aren't structured to take care of people for, for long periods of time. And so the LTACs are designed to take care of people who are really, really sick for long periods of time. Uh, many of the LTACs even have ICUs with, um, to take care of uh, ventilator-dependent patients. But it's for very serious care, and it's only good for 60 days. Then um, if someone needs rehabilitation, so an example I would use is if somebody has fallen and broken their hip, they can't go home alone, they need some rehabilitation, some physical therapy, they need some help with activities day, of daily living for a period of time, they'll be sent to a rehab facility. And the fundamental requirement with the rehab facility is the person must be able to withstand at least three hours a day of therapy. So if you think about it, and if someone is very elderly and very sickly and very frail, they won't be able to withstand that amount of physical therapy. So then they'll end up going to a SNF or a skilled nursing facility. And those are designed um, for folks who have special needs like feeding tubes, um, people with multiple things going on, or as they say in med speak, comorbidities. 
there is a minimum of three days and a maximum of 100 days. But the important thing to remember is SNFs are not designed to be long-term custodial care facilities. And here's where some of the misunderstanding comes in. People assume that if they need a skilled nursing facility for forever, they'll be able to collect it from Medicare, but they won't. Part A Medicare also covers hospice. Um, as some of you may know, or everybody may know, hospice is care designed to be comfort care as someone is terminally ill. And for Medicare purposes, a terminal illness is defined as one where the person is expected to die within the next six months. Now, it doesn't mean they will, and the Medicare benefit can be renewed if the person doesn't live for six months. But in general, it's intended that once you get a ter an illness, a diagnosis for a terminal illness, that you have less, less than six months to live. And I hope I'm not scaring anybody, but these are terms you need to know, and these are things we need to talk about as a society. Palliative care is sometimes confused with hospice care. Palliative care is symptom management. So if someone gets a cancer diagnosis, as an example, frequently they will get a referral to a palliative care physician because the treatments for cancer are so miserable that the, per, the, the patient may need additional help. So it's all intended to provide management of the symptoms that are noxious so that the person does better. And in fact, research has shown that for people with chronic illnesses who are assigned to palliative care specialists, they tend to live longer, live better, and they're less likely to do extreme things at the end of life. So on balance, it's, it, we're, it's something our medical system is still growing with and dealing with, um, but Medicare covers this benefit. Medicare also covers home health. So my dad, who is in his late 80s, a couple of years ago had been what we call a frequent flyer. He was in and out of the hospital multiple times over six months. And by the end of that six months, he was so weak, he couldn't do anything. So he was, uh, he went to a rehabilitation facility for a bit, and they did physical therapy with him. And then once he get, got home, the physical therapy continued. And the person actually came to his house. Um, they also sent, for the first several months, they sent a nurse to his house to take his blood pressure, to check his Coumadin levels, and to do all sorts of things. And Medicare A uh, covers all of that. Now, what is not permitted is you can't double dip. So, and these are rules that Medicare has made up, so I don't defend them, I just describe them. You cannot be in a skilled nursing facility and on hospice. So the hospice service, which is the nurses and the nurses' aides and the doctor and the chaplain and the social worker coming to visit you, are all covered, but if you need a place to stay, unless you're expected to, to die very soon, um, you, your family has to provide a place for you to live. And um, there's no such thing as home health in hospice. So that if you Need, uh, the home health services of checking your lungs and checking your blood pressure and checking your blood and stuff like that, that's not covered under home health. If you need any of those services, hospice has to cover it. So it's part of the hospice benefit. So that sometimes gets confusing. The other thing that is confusing sometimes is your hospice 
benefit is intended to cover the reason that you are dying. So if you are dying and you fall and break your arm, your broken arm will still be treated. But if you're dying of cancer, things that are related to the cancer diagnosis would not be treated. The hospice benefit is tied to the reason that you are in hospice. The cancer, the COPD, the congestive heart failure, um, any of those things. But if something happens to you that's unrelated to that diagnosis, it will still fix you. you know, they won't make you um, walk around without a broken arm, without a splint on it or something to keep you, because that would make you most uncomfortable, right? Questions? Does that make sense? So, um, Part A, Medicare, also has some funky rules. So, the, they're tied to how many days you need to be in the hospital before you qualify for rehab or LTAC or SNF services. So to qualify for rehab, you would have to be in the hospital for three consecutive midnights but to go to an LTAC, you'd have to be in an ICU for three consecutive midnights. So one of the questions that I frequently get, if you have, if you're on Medicare and you have some, or even regular insurance, and you have some interesting symptoms that are arising, when you go to the emergency room, they may admit you, but under observation status. And that means that for 23 hours and 59 minutes, you can stay in the hospital, they'll watch you, they may run some tests, they may do blood work, you know, um, but you will be expected to leave before the 24th hour hits. Again, that can be renewed for another day or two. If it happens to be for three midnights, if you're under observation status, you do not qualify for SNF. So you have to be admitted as a regular patient into the hospital for these things to kick in. So I've had people ask me, and they said, well, I was admitted but they called me observation, and some of the hospitals even have their own floors for observation patients. They're intended to be just that, to keep an eye on you, to see if they can figure out what's going, out, going on, and to see if you need to be admitted as a regular patient. Because remember, these days, you have to be pretty darn sick before them to admit you as a patient. Everything in the healthcare system is tied to trying to keep people out of the hospital because hospitals are expensive places. So if you're under observation for two days, does Medicare cover any of that cost? The question is, if you're under observation for two days, does Medicare cover it? Yes, Medicare covers it, but you would not be eligible to go to a SNF if you needed to and have Medicare pay for it. Okay? Other? Is that all clear as mud? So before you go to the hospital, you have to know you have some type of supplemental insurance that will cover a SNF. I'll I mean, talk. You've got to set all that up. If... If you want to have coverage for all of these contentions, there is such thing, and I'm not even trying to get into that today, long-term care insurance. Um, I'll give a shameless plug. We're doing a series on aging with grace um, with the church that starts the Wednesday after Easter, and we're covering the healthcare, financial, legal, and living 
issues associated with aging. And long-term care insurance is one of the topics we cover for that. And like I said, it's a shameless plug, but as you can see, all this stuff is really complicated. It's, there is so much information and there's so many things you have to understand and if this, then that, or you have to find somebody who can help you with this. So, then there are rules on the number of days. So if you go to the hospital and you're in the hospital for five days and you get sent home, and once you're at home, you say, I can't function. Or your family members say, this isn't working. They call the doc and they want to readmit to the hospital. Well, you're not sick enough to go back to the hospital. You might be sick enough to go to rehab, but that has to start within 30 days of your hospital event. And then if you go to a rehab facility, and then you get sent home and you're functioning along, you have to be at home for at least 60 days before the Medicare clock starts over again. So if you go home and you have a reoccurrence and you go back to the hospital, then you don't qualify for rehab again, unless you still have some of the original 60 days left over. It's so, as I said, Medicare has a coinsurance, um, or Medicare Part B. Well, A has deductibles, and I've given those here, the differences between 17 and 18. And the Co the, the, their lifetime reserves and their co-insurances, and the best I can tell you is if you have a loved one in the hospital and you're trying to sort it out, ask to talk to the social worker or the case manager. Either one of these people can help you determine your eligibility and figure out what all your, your cost profiles are going to be. And if you go to a rehab facility, again, they will have a case manager and they will help you to understand what your specific benefits are. And they are required to give you that information. So it sounds like as the caregiver to my mother, um, I need to, the minute they start observing her, go and find a case manager to be ready for whatever else they Ask to talk to the case manager. When you get admitted to the hospital, make sure if they're not saying, hey, we want you to talk to the case manager, you ask to talk to the case manager. I have a friend whose wife had um, a pretty serious ser surgery about a month ago, and he was complaining to me that um, they ha all they did was hand him a list of rehab facilities and say, here, check these out. And when he went online to check them on the Medicare Medicaid services website, he found out that some of those facilities that were on the list weren't even had had their approvals from Medicare from CMS lifted. And he said, oh, and I yelled at the doctor about that. And I said, you yelled at the wrong person. And he said, what do you mean? I said, the doctor doesn't control that. Those lists are maintained by the case managers social, slash social workers and most of, in most of the hospitals, those folks office together and work together. Um, case, the language, just to, to clarify, case managers are also um, certified nurses. Social workers are certified social workers. So some people don't understand what the difference is, but they, they do some of the same functions in terms of helping with placement for folks as a next step, um, but it, you, it's, it doesn't necessarily matter which one you talk to. The nurses ended up, end up being the ones, the case managers end up being the ones to uh, work with the facilities where your person's being transferred most often, 
just because they're nurses and they can give certain medical information that the social workers are limited on. Their focus is placement. They're not worried about what your out-of-pocket costs are going to be. But you, you ask because they, they know what the benefits are, right? They can help you with that. So Part B, as I've said, that's major medical. It covers um, the necessary services and supplies. It covers preventive services. It covers labs. Uh, outpatient visits, diagnostics, uh, special outpatient medications. If you need a, an IV of some sort, it will cover that. Um, and then it covers durable medical equipment. Now, the thing to remember is um, that has a five-year replacement. So as an example, when my stepmother was alive, um, a porta potty was delivered to my dad's house. So, fast forward, she's died. She has died. My dad needs the the special um, equipment. They said they look at their records and they say, "You still have one of those. You don't get another one." Now, here's where the funky stuff comes in. Medicare covers. Um, a potty chair, and they don't necessarily cover the raised one, special one for your toilet. Um, and they don't cover a shower chair. So lots of times they'll t uh, folks will tell you to, there, there are actually potty chairs that are sold that are meant to double as shower chairs so that you can have dual use. But again, right, you have to have somebody to move it in and out of the shower. So it all, it all is, a, um, is a mess. So here are the Medicare Part B premiums. And for those of you who are collecting Social Security and paying for Medicare Part B, you learned this year that you got a small raise in Social Security and your Medicare Part B premium went up, and in most cases it went up more than your Social Security went up. So folks, you know, I, I talk to lots of people and they say, you know, I, you know my, med, my, med, my social security went up $12 and my Medicare premium went up 17. And you go, yep. And for a lot of people, that makes a big difference, right? That $5 net every month. So when you listen to this stuff, pay attention. It is supposed to. Part B, uh, the question was about Part B covering an annual physical. Post Affordable Care Act, it is supposed to cover. Because what happened was Part B was set up to have parity with the Affordable Care Act benefits. And one of the uh, requirements of the Affordable Care Act is that a annual physical be covered at no cost. Uh, at the end, remember, I'm going to give you some resources where you can. So, Part C. That replaces, that's the Medicare replacement, and it covers A, B, and D. So, if any of you read the Houston Chronicle, Lisa Falkenberg had a really interesting series last year on her own father's challenges with his Medicare Part C program. In the Houston area alone, there are more than 80 different Medicare replacement offerings. They all have different benefits. They all have different costs. I said 80, it's 40, sorry. I, um, but they all have different parameters, okay? And so when you, I have a, um, a friend 
who is really proud of his Medicare Part C program. It's cheaper than A and B and D, and it's covered everything he's needed it to cover. But he hasn't been sick yet. <laughs> because what happens with the Medicare replacement programs, when you look at the needs for rehab facilities and LTACs and those kinds of things, all of those benefits are different. The doctors are different. The hospitals are different. So what Lisa Falkenberg wrote about was her own parents, her mom had some chronic problems, so her dad signed her up for a really, really good Part C replacement program. And he had always been healthy, so he just picked out something basic. Well, he turned up with stage four lung cancer, and it was a variety that was different enough that the, rec the only treatment place where he could go was MD Anderson. And guess what? MD Anderson wasn't on the approved list of providers for his C replacement program. Well, fortunately for him, he has a daughter who knows how to do stuff. So she took on the system and he did end up getting approved. And his doctor said, clearly the pen is mightier than the scalpel. Um, to which she responded, no, it was both of us working together. But the caveat then is unless you're prepared to really go to bat if something serious happens, that you pay really close attention to what the Part C or the Medicare replacement benefits are. You know, go on to their website, Google your docs, Google your hospital, and see if they're covered. So Part D has, you know, uh, for medications, has coverage gaps. Um, and there's the donut hole where you get covered for a while and then you don't get covered. So if your medication expenses are very high, you have to pay attention to this. Now, they do, there is some extra financial help. Again, um, I'll give you a resource at the end where you can, you can get more information on that because I wouldn't even begin to give you advice on that. Every person is different, every situation is different. All the drugs are different. If you're on the part, uh, the Medicare replacement program, the, the drug coverages are different. So again, the recommendation is that you look at your specific list of meds or your family member's list of meds and make sure that you're getting the support that you need. So that's Medicare in a nutshell. So let's move on to Medicaid. So Medicaid is, was originally designed to be a health coverage program for low-income adults, children, elderly, and disabled. It is administered by the states under federal guidelines. So again, every state has different rules and you just have to pay attention to what those rules are. So if you're living in Houston and your parents are living in Tennessee, then you have to look at what the Tennessee rules and requirements are. Traditional Medicaid has very limited coverage. Uh, covers home health, medical equipment, infusion care, that's the IV medicines, and hospice. So what a lot of the states have gone to is they've established HMO type programs, health maintenance organizations. So that um, there, there are a bunch of them again. There are several of them in Texas and you have to pay attention to which programs are serving which areas and how you carry it from there. They also cover durable medical equipment um, with pre-authorization, but that goes for almost everything these days. And they do have 
some skilled nursing facilities, LTAC facilities, and rehab. Here's the, the, the catch on the, the Medicaid, is there are severe income and asset restrictions. Just because your Medicare has run out doesn't mean that you're eligible for Medicaid. And some people make that assumption. Oh, if my Medicare runs out, I'll just switch to Medicaid. Doesn't work that way. So, yes? The state of Texas. Or, well, excuse me, you, the providers within the HMO? The HMO does. No, I mean, no, I mean the plan. The plan is all defined by the state of Texas. Um, because remember, those are the, it has to meet certain minimum federal guidelines, but it, since it's funded primarily by the state, the state makes the rules. So all of the eligibility rules and things like that are um, tied in. So um, qualifying for Medicaid, is, as, as I've said, is a combination of income and assets. So if you are a single senior citizen, you're widowed or never married, then you are allowed to have uh, an income of 2,100 and some odd dollars a month, and you can have no more than $2,000 in assets outside of your home, car, and funeral plan. So if you're married, the income goes up to about double, and the assets are a little more than double. I'm not sure how they came up with those numbers, but they didn't ask me. The catch with the Medicaid reimbursement is, in the state of Texas, the reimbursement rates are very low. So that if someone, even if they qualify for a nursing home rehab or SNF, there may not be one in your area, and they may not have room for extra patients. So we would have, when I was a hospital chaplain, we would have folks who had used up all their LTAC days, and the family was bound and determined to keep them going. Sometimes the person was awake, sometimes they weren't, but that's a whole other issue and they would have to go to a Medicaid LTAC, and the closest one to Houston is in San Antonio. The, uh, and remember I just said their reimbursement rates are low, so those folks have to survive financially. That's why within the Texas, under the Texas Ombudsman Program, a lot of the attention, I've been told they spend most of their attention on the Medicaid facilities. Because they have to make sure that those places are safe and that they're providing the minimum services. To qualify for Medicaid financially, remember I said the asset limitation outside of home, car, and funeral plan. Um, you can't just say, oops, I'm running out of money, I'm gonna give all my assets to my kids, and then they'll, they'll make sure that I'm okay on the side, but I'll qualify for Medicaid. There's a five-year look back. And again, I'm not gonna to begin to give you the financial implications, all that. I would just say, if you have more assets than that, and you anticipate that a time might come that you're going to run out of money, work with a financial planner. And um, finally, there's something called the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program. Medicaid Estate Recovery Program. What this means is, remember I said your house and your car exempted, if your family member goes into a Medicaid nursing facility, so they've passed all the other means tests and they're admitted to the skilled nursing facility and they live out their days there, 
Once the person dies, Medicaid can come back and attach some of those assets. So I've had, I've worked with folks, um, not here, but when I was doing stuff at UTMB, and they were surprised to learn that their Aunt Sally had been in a Medicaid nursing facility, and Aunt Sally died. Aunt Sally had a house. They went to sell the house, and Medicaid's knocking on the door saying, we want to recover those expenditures. Nobody, they claimed, and I can believe they may not have heard it and they may not have been told. Not my judgment to make but it can get really confusing when you think you've done your best to take care of someone and all of a sudden the, the recovery folks are on your front door. So my only warning with you here is if you are taking care of someone who has to use Medicaid services as a senior, pay attention to that stuff and work with professionals to figure it all out. Again, I'm, I can't give you all the ins and outs, but I know this happens. And, it, and they'll tell you. They tell you on the website. But most folks don't, haven't paid attention to that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Joyce is saying she, she was on the board of a, a rural health clinic. Died. So grandma only had the house, they sold the house, and then the family lost everything. So what about if the total bill only is, let's say, 200000 and the house sells for 100000 Do they come after the, uh, the heir saying, you owe 100000 or do they stop once they collect? If the house is only 100000 they stop. Right. So the question is, if the house is, say, somebody, the expenditure has been 200000 and the house is only 100000 they don't come after the rest of the heirs for the other 100000 On the other hand, if grandma had some antique jewelry and who knows what all, they'll, they'll happily take that. But, um, the, I mean, the things I've heard about were just the house and this ugly surprise of finding out that the, the proceeds were going to go back to Medicaid. Um, this one? Okay. So the qualifying is the $2,000 for a single person, a $2,000 limit excluding house, car, and funeral plan. Um, I, no, uh, so that if you have a lot of jewelry, you're expected to, that's in the assets that aren't excluded. As far as the furniture, right. So if you have a lot of, you know, most folks that wouldn't be a very big number, but if you have a lot of antique furniture or something, then it could be. So Medicaid has very specific long-term care criteria for you even to be eligible, regardless of what your financial things are. So the rule is your needs have to exceed the care of an untrained caregiver in the home. 
So, uh, for example, somebody has a big wound, has an open wound, or they have a peg tube, a feeding tube, uh, dementia, psychiatric needs, something like that, those would be qualifying events. And in that, that nurse supervision is required. Because lots of people are old and they just need somebody in the house to, make, to keep them company. That won't qualify you for a Medicaid facility. It must be ordered by a physician. And there has to be evidence that the person cannot take care of themselves. So it does get investigated. Just like if you have a long-term care plan and you want to invoke the plan to provide a caregiver for your loved one, somebody from the long-term care plan is gonna come out and qualify you in addition to the doctor's recommendation. Understand? Are we good? Okay, so I said I promised a list of resources. Um, professional health advocates, um, some of these I'm personally familiar with, some not. Um, but the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is cms.gov. That's your, that's your go-to overriding website for everything. For Harris County, Medicare provides currently and I emphasize currently because it's one of the services that's potentially on the chopping block for the budget, is to have an agent, the Harris County Agency on Aging, and this is your go-to place about anything specific on Medicare and Medicaid to your loved one in Harris County. They have all kinds of resources. If you go to their website, they have caregiver resources, they have advice on all kinds of things. And the feedback I've gotten is that these folks know what they're doing. Then um, if you want to know more about Medicare, uh, oh, the Harris County Ombudsman Program, this is the group that is um, charged with watching all the long-term care facilities. And we're fortunate in Harris County because they're very active and they have raised extra money for themselves so that they have more staff ombudsmen and they have a huge volunteer program. And they, so they have volunteers who go around, take two to four hours out of their week every week, sometimes more, to go visit facilities and to serve as troubleshooters and just have eyeballs on the place. And they're trained and they are wonderful people. Um, this is the Medicare Advantage plans in Harris County. As I said, there are 40 different plans. If, you, if your family member thinks that what, that's what they wanna do to um, provide their medical care, take a look at it. Uh, medication assistance programs is needymeds.org. Um, sometimes you'll see on the ads on the news or that are on the television, they'll say at the end, if you need help, contact a direct website. That's useful for a single medication, but Needy Meds has discounts and you can look up where specific drugs are cheaper because they may be a different price at different pharmacies or different locations. Yes, ma'am. Is that site just for Texas or is that your own guys? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's everybody, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't swear to that. Um, Medi Texas Medicaid and CHIP, they're two different websites. And then, so I've said all this, veterans are a whole different bailiwick. So if your family member or you are a veteran, then talk to the Department of Veterans Affairs because all of the healthcare benefits are different. 
In most cases, they're much better, particularly when it comes to long-term care facilities. As it should be, I mean, we need to take care of our service people. So, in summary, Medicare and Medicaid work together in some cases, um, or they'll work separately, depending on what your specific needs and qualifications are. Um, Medicaid is not an automatic benefit. It is means tested. I can't say this enough. Um, as I just mentioned, veterans have completely different rules. But what I can't, also can't emphasize enough is all of these policies that are going on are going to affect all of us, either directly or in taking care of our parents or loved ones. I cannot emphasize enough to pay attention. Pay attention when they start talking about the budget items. Because I can guarantee you, it may not affect you today, but it will affect you at some point. And I don't care what your political leanings are, you still need to understand what the ramifications are of this stuff. Some of it has to do with what do we want, what kind of a people do we want to be? Basic ethics questions. And finally, um, plan ahead. Um, don't just assume that everything will fall into place, because in some cases, you will need to do some things with your, your own assets or with your parents' assets. And so this is another list of resources. The, um, the one I've, I have put in here, particularly some of the articles that Lisa Falkenberg wrote, because they make really interesting reading on what her specific issues were with the Medicare Part C uh, replacement. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the Medicare CMS has numbers out the yin-yang, so you can look up specific data for states, for disease processes. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the question was, are the deductibles the same for every year? And the short answer is, they start, the clock starts over after every year. Other questions? Oh, y'all are easy. a big, whoa, political thing, instead of, how does that apply to me? Because even when people hated anything about health care reform, they were being impacted by it. Mm -hmm. It just seems illogical that we get so political, whoa, instead of, oh my goodness, this is going to hit me in a year. <laughs> it's, um, the question, or the statement was, how did this all happen? You know, how did we get to a point Think about it in terms of dollar signs. Healthcare has, for the last umpteen years, has consistently exceeded the GDP growth rate. Healthcare inflation is very real. Um, you know, Joni will tell you that the costs, even for the employees here at St. Martin's, have gone sky high. Um, I have a, I worked with a woman some years ago, or not that long ago, about five years ago, who was an attorney. She, her specialty was bankruptcy law. And she said most of her clients were people who had had a health event. That health costs were, because the, the rules on credit cards and stuff like that are tight enough now that most people are protected from doing something really stupid. But she said 80% of her client base um, 
were people who had had a health event and their coverage, whether they had health insurance or not, didn't pan out, didn't cover the cost of the event. And so to me, that's a really scary thing that somebody can work really hard all of their lives, and now I am sounding political, but you can work really hard all your life and have an issue that comes up and still lose everything. You see, that's not political because it will happen to most people. Something will occur with the, the statistics. Even the, if you're healthy and everything's fine today, you know, we, The numbers that, um, there's a group, and I can't remember their name off the top of our head, off of my head, but every year they tell you how much you, it's going to cost you to pay your Medicare insurance premiums and your co-pays and your deductibles. And that number has gone up to, from 65 to death, that number is somewhere in the $350,000 range. And I'm, I have an MBA, so I sat down and I said, how can that be? But then I sat down and said, okay, if somebody lives another 20 years and they have even just regular things every year where they're, they have you know, a, the flu or do something, just paying your co-pays and deductibles almost gets to that number. That's pretty scary. It, it doesn't take much. And if, you know, my husband and I will eventually end up, you know, paying, and I added it up for what it would cost for the two of us, and I went, yikes, I better keep working. Okay, other questions? comments. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, Liz is going to have walk you through the um, uh, survey. Um, thank you for coming today. Please come back to one of our other programs. Um, we really are doing some cool stuff here. And um, I'm very, you know, I'm obviously here and I'm very proud of what we're doing. I'm really proud of the Hope and Healing Center and our outreach into the community and trying to help folks. So, thank you.